That's when I freeze. Freak. <laughs> Scream. <laughs> <laughs> you actually shouldn't. You shouldn't even tell us when it starts. Good evening, folks. Uh, welcome to our Finger Lakes Wine uh, Alliance virtual tasting series. Um, my name is Jeff Hauk. I'm from Lucas Vineyards. I'm going to be our moderator this evening. And I'm also going to be one of the uh, panelists in our second panel. Um, I'm going to just go through and explain how this evening is going to work. We have uh, um, some principals from uh, seven different wineries here this evening. We're going to have two flights of wines. One is going to be sparkling wine, and the second flight is going to be dessert wines. Um, these wines, uh, again, the first flight will be three wineries, and we're hoping that you've had a chance to try your wines already. The winemakers and owners have tried these wines, and we're going to go through and talk about them in a moment. Um, this evening, you can follow us on Twitter also for... Uh, to have uh, live feedback on how the tasting and questions are going. You also can follow our Ustream. We do have commercials on our Ustream uh, channel, so uh, that will uh, have a small delay in our program this evening. Um, we're going to go ahead and get into our first flight tonight. I'm going to introduce uh, Vinny Alaperti. He's a winemaker at Atwater Estate Vineyards on the east side of Seneca Lake. Vinny's been around the Finger Lakes for a long time has a great reputation for uh, a number of things that he does in the, with the Finger Lakes wineries. He also has his own winery, Billsboro Winery. Um, Vinny is going to talk a little bit about his wine, and um, I think you, I'm sure you enjoyed that this evening. Vinny, can you go through and tell us a little bit about that 2008 Cuvée Sparkling Wine? Yes, I will. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this is a 08, as Jeff mentioned. Uh, to talk a little bit about the vintage, uh, it was actually one of those years in my mind where whites and reds did equally as well. Uh, we had just amount, just the right amount of rainfall, sunshine. Um, uh, this was picked, um, as, as most sparkling wines are, uh, earlier uh, than most of our of our varieties. Uh, basically, the reason you pick sparkling wine on the earlier side is to maintain a lower sugar value, which of course corresponds to alcohol values. You want to keep that in check um, so that when you proceed with your secondary fermentation, uh, you are um, you are not stressing the yeasts out um, and uh, maintaining uh, the proper balance in your wine. Um, this is a blend, a co-fermented blend of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, in fact, it's two thirds Pinot Noir and one third Chardonnay. Uh, we pick those uh, simultaneously. Uh, they happen to ripen at about the same time. So it's a it's a nice um, uh, you know synergy there. Um, they came in. We uh, picked them by hand, whole cluster, pressed them, which is pretty standard procedure. Uh, settled the wine, uh, proceeded with the primary fermentation, and the following um, the following summer is when we bottled them um, uh, um, and proceeded to in, you know inoculate them for the second time uh, to allow them to ferment in the bottle. Secondary fermentation in the bottle, um, and going forward, they sat in the bottle for. Uh, actually, the wine you're tasting sat in the bottle um, in Tourage on on its yeast um, for almost three years. Um, so I think you would uh, agree that you can sort of you can pick up those brioche and creamy characteristics in the wine from that extended lease contact. So you pretty much. Um, Vinny have kind of explained. We had a question about explaining the traditional method of making sparkling wine. You almost got all the way through, so you got us into Tourage. Then what happens from that point forward? Right. So we we bottled that wine, the primary bottling, um, in August. This is the following the alcoholic fermentation. So we now have around 10% alcohol, and we now inoculate the wine for a second time with with yeast and a little bit of sugar. Uh, of course, that encourages the yeast to start um, the carbonation in the bottle and also increases the alcohol in the bottle. Once that's complete in the bottle, um, those bottles are laid down to rest and it's up to the, the winery or the winemaker's um, style, inventory. There's a lot of factors that go into how long to lay that bottle down. Once you're happy with um, the time span of the Tourage or that aging uh, period, 
Uh, you then proceed to disgorge the wine, which is a yeah fact, uh, the little factor I skipped. But that is um, that's basically the the, the end point um, where the wine is then riddled. Um, you put the wines on riddling racks. There's traditional riddling racks. There's mechanical riddling racks. But the idea is you you invert the bottles, uh, which pulls the yeast to the neck of the bottle, um, and that takes mm, two to three weeks, depending on um, your system. And at that point, the wines are ready for dis disgorging. Uh, you release that that plug of yeast uh, that has collected in the neck of the bottle, and then you actually replace what's lost uh, with what they call a dosage. That is another decision that needs to be made, whether you add sweetness or just more of the same products back. Uh, this wine was was um, uh, dosaged with approximately seven grams of, of sugar. Uh, that's what the wine currently is, seven, seven grams per liter uh, residual. Uh, at that stage, the cork goes in, wire hood, uh, your, your capsule, and the wine's actually at that point ready for, for, for sale. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, the, the wines you're tasting tonight is actually um, uh, the product of a three years um, on, its, on, its, uh, on its yeast or very, cheese. Yeah. Very good explanation, uh, Vinny. I think uh, everyone got a picture of the labor that goes in. It is a very labor intensive process. I think a lot of Finger Lakes winemakers realize not our most profitable item in the uh, winery. But um, a really cool product and um, something that our customers really enjoy. Um, Vinny, did you happen to throw out to us the suggested retail price of that bottle? Uh, yes. So uh, the 2008 is now for sale for $30 uh, retail. Um, we feel that being a handcrafted product, um, the amount of labor, as, as you mentioned, that goes into it, it's very intensive. Um, it's, a, it's actually a very... It's a it's a pleasure to make these these wines. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of romance uh, tied up in this traditional method, um, and I think the the proof is in the wine. Um, the, the the you can taste the 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 uh, the, in, the passion, the the labor, and, and the love that goes into the wine. So, so thank we you hope very, you enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vinny. Um, great job. And we're going to move on to our second wine of the evening. Um, we have with us the pleasure of having uh, uh, one of the older families in the Finger Lakes wine industry. We have John McGregor from McGregor Vineyards on Cuca Lake. John's family was one of the first small wineries in the Finger Lakes. And um, John had brought with him this evening a 2008 Blanc de Noir, 100% Pinot Noir sparkling wine. And um, John, can you take us through a little bit about that wine? and? Um, Sure. Tell us a little bit about the process you, when you made that wine. Well, I think, um, generally speaking, what Vinny spoke about process-wise is almost identical to what we did uh, with this wine. 2008 vintage, it was 11 months uh, before it went into the bottle, uh, aged for two and a half months in the bottle, uh, riddled by hand, uh, and then put out on the market. Uh, it's a little different for us, uh, for our traditional uh, Blanc de Noir. Uh, we tend to blend with Chardonnay and it was really for my selfish desires more than anything that I wanted to try doing 100% Pinot Noir to uh, familiarize myself with uh, the character that the Pinot Noir presents to our traditional blend of, of uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, we have been making a Blanc de Noir and a Blanc de Blanc, uh, which is a 100% Chardonnay at our vineyard uh, since the mid 80s. And really, it was more of an experimentation than anything else to do 100% Pinot Noir. And I'm quite happy with the results. I think. Uh, you get a very fruit forward, uh, nice creamy textured uh, sparkling wine. Probably a basic question, John, but I think I've heard customers ask this before. That's Pinot Noir. Uh, how did you get that red skinned grape to be uh, a white wine? I think customers are always interested in how that process happens. You don't allow fermentation uh, 
in contact with the skins. The skins contain the colors that are extracted through the fermentation process. So you're you're pressing that off prior to uh, that that moment where the the color pigmentation breaks down. Great. So you get a little bit of the red wine character on the palate, but not yeah. in the color. Um, John, you guys, your family has been in operation for over 40 years. Um, we're guessing maybe you have some older sparkling wine in your cellar. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about um, some tasting some older sparkling sure. wines from the Finger Lakes? Uh, we started our vineyard 40 years ago, a little over 40 years ago. The, the winery itself uh, was established in 1980, so we've got a little over 30 years of vintages uh, with respect to sparkling wines we started crafting them in 84 or 85 uh, which we still have uh, bottles of I, I would say those at this point are um, by and large more of a novelty to open um, they tend to be quite nice for your first glass and then oxidation gets to them and they, they fall apart but what I can say with respect to ageability uh, from this region and our experience is very good with sparkling wines. Our early 90s um, sparkling wines are still fantastic. Uh, great. So, great potential. Could you, John, just comment on, uh, um, and any of the panelists could answer this if John doesn't want to take it, why sparkling wine in the Finger Lakes? I think right off the bat our climate is suited for it. Uh, a cooler climate, again, as Vinny said, you're picking earlier, so you, you do have a greater degree of freedom um, regardless of being in a cool climate. But um, it just seems that the minerality that we have coming out of, of um, the soils into the grapes is very amenable to these very fresh, clean, Sparkling wines. So um, labor love. Vinny or Dave, either one of you guys want to add in on that? Yeah, the uh, I, I think the that crisp natural acidity is a key component in these uh, in a lot of these wines. Uh, I think we also arguably in a cooler climate get a little bit more flavor development at a lower bricks than a warmer region. So I, I think we're more naturally suited in, in a number of ways. Thank you. Um, John, one other question. Could uh, your Blanc de Noir, could you give us the retail price on that? Uh, we charge $30 as well. Okay. I, I think uh, th those are both very reasonable prices uh, for a bottle fermented sparkling wine. If you look in the world of uh, wine, that's actually a very good value for bottle fermented product. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our third panelist this evening. Um, actually, I want to hold on for one second. Um, John, uh, could would you have a food pairing you could recommend with the uh, Blanc de Noir, or or possibly with the dry sparkling wine in general? Uh, I think. Uh, I oysters. apologize. That was a late question. That, that's anyway. fine. Oysters on the shell. I know it's really traditional, but um, it works so well with these wines that that that's my knee jerk. Thanks, Answer. that's my uh, quick question for you. Um, next up this evening, uh, we have with us Dave Peterson. Uh, Dave is uh, owner and general manager of Swedish Hill Winery on Cayuga Lake. Um, also a good friend. He's been uh, in the industry and been very helpful, not only to myself, but a lot of other uh, Finger Lakes owners and winemakers and does a great job. Swedish Hill uh, has won tons of awards every year for sparkling wine and all their other wines. Riesling Cuvée was a Governor's Cup winner a couple of years ago. Um, Dave, can you take us through uh, and tell us a little bit about how that wine was made? Well, I think this provides an opportunity for great contrast for the diversity of what is possible with sparkling wines in the Finger Lakes. Um, we also make a traditional uh, sparkling wine such as uh, these very good examples have been presented here as well. But uh, the reason Cuvée breaks with tradition in arguably every way, it's, it's taking a non-traditional sparkling wine variety, 
Um, although there are other Riesling sparklings made in the Finger Lakes um, and certainly in Germany, but, but it, it takes a non-traditional variety in a non-traditional process. And I think part of uh, the success of this wine is is the fact that it's not a Methode Champenois bottle fermented uh, sparkling wine. Uh, you notice from the characters in the previous two lines, uh, a lot of the complexities of those wines are very much driven by the aging process and aging and tirage. Um, the, the intention with this sparkling wine is to limit the uh, amount of yeast contact as much as possible. So it's fermented, it's tank fermented, uh, so we're trying to preserve that Riesling flavor in this wine as much as is entirely possible. So it's still cool fermented, and I think tank fermentation get historically has gotten a bit of a bad rap because of how it was done, arguably, and by, by bulk producers uh, trying to rush it through as quick as possible, uh, not necess necessarily fermenting at proper cooler temperatures. So, uh, and, and arguably some of the things with larger bubble size and everything else that you might see in, in uh, bulk produced ones, uh, the bubbles if you control the fermentation rate, still can be fine. This is also intentionally a bit lower charge or, or the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that is in there is intentionally a bit lower than what we would do in the traditional process. Uh, Prosecco has sort of opened the door for styles of uh, the popularity of Prosecco, I think, has shown that consumers like diversity in flavors in sparkling wines and that's that's what we're trying to present here. Not that this certainly is not a Prosecco, but it, it, Proseccos are supposed to be uh, that fresher, uh, more fruit-driven type of flavor, and, and that's what we're aiming for here. Um, you know, Riesling lends itself to sparkling wine in a number of ways, I think. Uh, certainly at uh, great natural acidity here in the Finger Lakes, we picked this at uh, just about 19 bricks. Uh, this is non vintage, but it is made from a 2000, the 2010 vintage, which was actually a bit warmer uh, vintage, but Riesling still had great acidity at that, at that time. One of the keys, I think, on Riesling sparkling is uh, as it gets, as it ripens, sometimes, especially if it starts raining, you can get some bunch rots. Uh, keep for sparkling wines, making sure that the fruit is really clean. Uh, reduces the probability of phenolics getting in the bitter flavors and phenolics and, and some other things going on and keeping that fresh reason fruit. Right. With having the um, less labor intensive process, Dave, but how does that affect your uh, retail price on that product? Uh, well, it, it's $18. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's, we certainly can, uh, we're, we're, we don't have the wine tied up in tirage, certainly as long as, as for example, these, these wines and a bit less of the hand labor. It's, it's still more work than making uh, traditional Riesling still wines. Uh, and, and there's some other things, uh, higher glass costs and so forth. But, but it's certainly less labor than, than the, the throat ship and more ones. Um, for you, Dave, and then maybe I'll ask a couple of our other panelists. Uh, um, one of the media had asked, what's your favorite part about making sparkling wine? <laughs> um, when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> when it's done, yeah, after it's sold. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I mean, I think it, I think all of us enjoy the diversity of some of the things that we work with. And, and sparkling wines are, um, I think, presenting for us, we make a range of sparkling wines. And uh, when we do tastings of, of uh, we have four different sparkling wines that we're pouring in our tasting room, when people can discover the range of flavors that they can get. And then we also talk about how some of these things might be used. They're not just for New Year's uh, or weddings and, and uh, people that think they don't like sparkling wine because they've only tasted one type, uh, having them, exposing them to a greater range of styles is, is one of the really gratifying things to me. Um, and, and it's really a labor of love for all of us that do it. I think we all agree with that. Yeah, for sure. I would add, well actually what's, what's 
exciting and also somewhat terrifying is after in the method Champenois process is after you 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 uh, you bottle you you start a second culture. We talked about talked about that earlier, and then you're bottling your wines and then crossing your fingers that that second culture is going to uh, do its job in the bottle because you've tied up a lot of money in, in that glass and time to get to that point. Uh, so four, six, ten weeks later, you start checking in those bottles and uh, you're hoping that you're something, hoping something is happening in that bottle. Um, so far, knock on wood, I've, I've had good success. Winemaker's um, worst nightmare, pop it open and there's and no And then pop. there's nothing <laughs> in there. So uh, that is probably one of the most satisfying parts of the, of the process. I think with um, sparkling wine a lot, and wine in general, a lot of people like to uh, see who we compare ourselves to in other parts of the world. Would anyone compare Finger Lakes sparkling wine to either um, uh, another region around the world that um, people would say like the flavor profiles um, I know with a lot of wines people always want to know what is ours like is it like a, a sparkling wine from a different region anyone depends on which one of these you're talking about really yeah that's the the beauty of the Finger Lakes is we are creating such a broad palette of, of sparkling wines that uh, there is a finger like Finger Lakes aspect to them all but I think you could also make comparisons probably with with uh, with the Atwater example here to some fine champagnes um, but they're Finger Lakes yeah no I agree I mean I think it depends on the region um, and even within a region there's variability you know whether it's on the west coast of California and the hills um, you know, there's some similarities in cooler parts of California, Oregon. Um, you know, we talked about France. Um, so I think there's always comparisons that are worth making, but um, but it's it's not so easy. It's not it's not that linear. You know, when you when you want to make a direct connection. I, I think with some of these, uh, it, 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 you know, John made the point about it, depending on which one you're talking about. But I think uh, for the for sparkling wines that are made more in the fruit driven styles, I think I think it's more, some of the more obvious Finger Lakes things come out. I think in some of the age styles, it's easier to make comparisons to uh, traditional champagnes uh, because aging becomes a more important part of the process. I think chemistry, uh, some of those things, we do have some comparisons to, to champagne. Uh, so I think in that respect, you know, there there are some likenesses certainly in the first two wines, uh, just real classic wines from the Champagne. Very good. Well, I want to take a minute and thank our first uh, group of panelists. You guys have gave us some great information and some great wines to try, and um, we're going to wrap up our first tasting. And um, you guys are free. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to bring in our second uh, group, and. Um, Thank you very much, guys. We'll be Thanks. back in a few moments. All right, welcome back, folks. We're getting ready to start our second flight this evening. Hopefully, you've all had a chance to try some uh, delicious dessert wines from the Finger Lakes. Um, we're going to, we have uh, three Vidals this evening and one Gewürztraminer. And um, we'll get into the meat of these wines in a moment. Um, I'd like to first introduce uh, our first wine the second flight and we have Steve Richards general manager of Casa Larga Vineyards with us tonight Casa Larga Vineyards if you're not that familiar with them you should be they uh, make some great dessert wines and have a great reputation for them they win numerous awards uh, um, best of class uh, many honors for the particular wine that Steve has this evening that you had a chance to try so, um, Steve, welcome this evening. Could you tell us a little bit about that 2008 Vidal Ice Wine? Sure thing, Jeff. Uh, well, I'm really happy to be here to represent Casa Larga. Uh, basically, the founder in 1995, Andrew Colaratolo, uh, said we need a dessert wine. And this, and Casa Larga was all set to go out and actually just purchase some ice wine juice. But then he said, well, no, let's do it ourselves. And that's really how it all started. And it's, it's uh, in, in rooted in tradition, uh, we went out to do it ice wine style, which is the German style when you pick it frozen on the vine. Um, I think another 
thing that I like to say also is the bottle's got little stars on it, and the name on the bottle is Fiori della Stella. And what that means in Italian is flower of the stars. And the owner's wife came up with that because we pick, if you'll notice that most uh, clear nights are the cold nights that you actually pick the ice wine grapes. So when you're out there at three, four in the morning, uh, the stars are out. It's very you know cold and crisp, and that's how it's got its name. The 2008 was a a very nice vintage year. It was uh, a year where it was a little cooler, at least especially at our location. Our location's a little higher up, a little further north than most Finger Lakes wineries. In fact, we're on the very northern edge of the Finger Lake, Lakes uh, Appalachian. Um, the acid levels are very nice in the wine, so when we got the concentrated juice out of the frozen grapes, which after we picked them frozen off the vine, we put in a basket press, and it has a hydraulic press, and it very slowly trickles out, but it offsets a lot of the sweetness, so it's quite a balanced dessert wine, quite a nice balance to it. Um, we do, present, we do uh, also produce quite a few other ice wines. Uh, the dolls definitely are uh, champion, I would say. Def it's won quite a few awards. I think our one of our crowning achievements was winning the uh, International uh, Wine and Spirits competition in London, uh, and that was where our 05 vintage. We still have a couple cases of that, and that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I think you'll notice on the 08 that it's got a little age on it. You know, we like to bottle condition almost everything at Casa Larga for about two years. Uh, this has got, you know, four years on it. Uh, we do have a Gewurz ice wine, a Riesling ice wine, Cab Franc ice wine. Um, and people, I know there's some questions on here, what do you pair with the wines? I like to uh, pair it uh, with fruit salad a lot of times. It's one of my favorite pairings for ice wine. Um, and I heard also, what do you say to people that don't like dessert wines? Um, for me, there's always a, a perfect spot for a wine uh, within a, a dinner or a family gathering, and I think Ice wine for dessert is a very good accompaniment to uh, whatever you're having, but uh, I like to mix it up a little bit with cashews and uh, like sorry, gorgonzola, something savory, some salt also at the sweet. Um, so I hope you enjoy your uh, taste of the 2008 uh, Vidal ice wine that we have here. I know uh, I enjoy it every time I, I uh, sip it, and if you do want to come to the Finger Lakes to try all the ice wines, uh, most all the ice wines in Phoenix, we do have an ice wine festival on February 16th at Castel Arias. So we gather all the wineries together and you can taste them all there. So, so cheers. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, great information. And um, having tried the wine a couple of minutes ago myself, I thought it was delicious. A uh, real nice wine. Um, so our second panelist this evening, that's me. <laughs> I'm Jeff Hauk from uh, Lucas Vineyards. Uh, I have our 2010 Vidal Ice Wine. And um, I'm off camera, but you'll be able to hear my voice over here. Um, the uh, Lucas Vineyards, we're on the uh, west side of Cayuga Lake. And we are in our 32nd year. We've been making uh, iced wine for about six years now. I believe that was our sixth vintage. Um, you'll notice on your bottle, if you're looking uh, where you're doing the tasting, it's called Vidal Blanc Iced. Iced wine is where we pick the grapes late in the season. Usually um, we try to pick them right around uh, when we feel their optimum ripeness. They almost could be uh, the harvest parameters almost bordering on a, a late harvest. And at that point we pick them. This year's version was just picked last week and then we send them to a cold storage uh, facility. Why do we use the Vidal grapes? The Vidal grape has beautiful acidity which stands up to the sweetness. The grapes hold up beautiful. Um, when we picked those grapes last week they looked absolutely gorgeous and even in a year like last year when we had excessive rain the Vidal grapes very late in the season still look beautiful. So it's well suited as a dessert wine both for, for both reasons, the grapes holding up in the vineyard and that beautiful acidity. And um, I think it comes through, um, having tried those wines a few moments ago and um, those Vidal's, I love the uh, acid sugar balance. And that was our, uh, really what pushed our decision to use Vidal for a dessert wine, the uh, beautiful balance of sugar and acidity. Um, we had another question come in. 
natural freezing or not, of course, for myself, I just told you. Uh, Lucas Vineyards does not use natural freezing. Uh, we, uh, I felt it was natural that I take it to a cold storage facility. <laughs> and um, when the wines are poured in a tasting setting like this, um, I, I feel that I like to let the wines speak for themselves. I, I feel that wines made in this style that I'm making them will stand up very well to traditional ice wines. If I was charging $60 a bottle for uh, ice wine, I would definitely say that that was a much better process. But um, I feel that both styles can make delicious dessert wines and um, both can be very distinctive and I think it's more a stylistic preference, but I feel that both can make a delicious dessert wine. Um, so, and I think like if you talk to other panelists, you'll get a similar thing. There's no doubt that um, there could be a difference in concentration with a traditional, but I think for us, most customers have not been able to pick up on that that much, and um, they definitely enjoy the uh, $24.95 price tag for the wine that fits very nicely with the rest of our pricing structure. Um, and I think for, for me, that kind of wraps up things for the Lucas wine. Um, again, we're here looking for other questions from our panelists. I have one more question here. Um, we had some guests who had asked about the label on my wine. And um, it's kind of uh, my sister-in-law and wife kind of come up with some of the label ideas, mostly my sister-in-law, uh, Ruthie Crawford. And um, it's uh, just kind of Ruthie's imagination. It could be a lady, uh, in, uh, or it could be whatever you happen to see as you look at that label. I, I'm assuming they're talking about the artwork and not uh, the wine speak on the back label. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I, I wanted to go back for one second. Steve, did I ask you your retail price on uh, your? No, wine? it's uh, forty-four ninety-nine. Okay, and um, with that, I'm going to uh, move on to the. Um, Next panelist, I feel like I've had Steve here on these virtual tastings a few times. <laughs> he, uh, um, I know he's been here, I think, uh, maybe three of them this year. Um, Steve DeFrancesco, longtime Finger Lakes winemaker, and uh, I mentioned it at another tasting. Uh, Steve was a huge help to me when I first got involved in the winemaking, and uh, I still have his number in my Rolodex, so when I can't figure something out, I call Steve. Um, Steve does a great job with uh, Nap Winery and also Glenora Wine Cellars. He uh, makes wonderful Riesling, sparkling wine, and another example here, dessert wine. Um, Steve, you want to talk to us a little bit about your 2010 Vidal Ice Wine? Sure, Jeff. Thank you for uh, having me here. and uh, It's a pleasure to be with the audience. Um, this is our uh, 10 Vidal ice wine, naturally frozen. We picked it on December 14th. It was like 13 degrees that day. Um, and it stayed 13. It, it never got above 18 degrees, which was really fortunate because we were able to press it and they didn't thaw out. Uh, this was the second time we made ice wine in 10, 2010. We did it in 08. Also, that worked out. 09, we weren't. Uh, real confident with the way the grapes are holding up on the vine and didn't figure that they would make it till then. And we actually made um, uh, uh, artificially frozen um, uh, ice wine that, iced wine that year. Um, and um, in 2011, the, har the uh, um, growing season of 2011, it was really wet. Uh, the dolls hold up great, they have acidity. They um, handle disease pressure. That year they didn't uh, by <laughs> by the end of the season. And uh, we didn't get our, uh, it wasn't cold also. It, it didn't get cold enough until January 3rd, 2012, which makes it that vintage. We did pick and press, but uh, by mid-afternoon they were already thawing out and the bricks were dropping like crazy. So half of it ended up being sort of a late harvest style, which we, we haven't bottled either yet. Um, uh, so um, just because 08 and 2010 worked out so well for us, uh, we had 11 uh, show us just how much we're at the mercy of Mother Nature. 
and uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, but 2010 was uh, everything worked out really nicely. It really cooperated and got cold enough. We had a um, group of uh, about 20 volunteers and 10 uh, migrants who picked professionally. And the volunteers um, were shown up uh, <laughs> by the migrants because <laughs> they way out picked us. And even my friend Steve helped out that day. Uh, you know. And they did. We, we, it, everything worked out so nicely. Um, so um, now making the line was a little bit of a, of a different story because the 2010, as well as the 08, didn't want to ferment as far as we wanted it to. It ended up at 23 bricks uh, or 23% uh, sugar at the end. Uh, and just couldn't get it to, to keep going. So that's what it decided to be. It's about 9% alcohol. Uh, very too slick, but delicious. Very nice Thank you. Um, uh, a couple of questions that we had come in um, for you, Steve. Uh, someone absolutely uh, loved the apricot flavors. Um, do you try and uh, replicate other styles? With this wine, or is it just a certain style you're trying to do, or do you let the grapes mm -hmm. kind of dictate the wine? Well, I think that um, we have uh, tremendous respect for uh, traditional wine growing regions that have lots of history behind them, in other words, in Europe, uh, that have many centuries of winemaking. But we're not in Europe, we're not, we, we can respect that and um, maybe pay tribute to it by uh, building wine. That pays tribute to that, but they really are Fairy Lakes wines, and we're very proud of what we have here and a reputation we can build here. Um, and I think somebody mentioned that it reminded them of Tokai, which is a real compliment. I, I appreciate that. But we are the Fairy Lakes, and that's uh, what, what we want to be. Great. Um, I'm going to throw this one at you too, Steve. Uh, is Riesling too valuable as a dry or semi dry wine to attempt to make Riesling ice wine? Well, to I think to leave it on the vine, it's probably not going to hold up uh, that well. Although you guys are doing it, um, and other people do, Sheldrake does a good job of it too by leaving it off. Uh, but it's not as sturdy as Madal. Uh, but other than that, no, there's no reason not to make uh, you know, for ice vines. And we're going to try one of the other ones. And uh, we had the one tough question, Steve. Yeah. That uh, people are just like, how do you get people uh, kind of to? introduce them to uh, these style of wines. Well, a lot of people don't seem to think of that as their take-home wine. Well, either people like sweet wine and just want sugar, and they would like Niagara, which is a wonderful grape and fine wine for what it wants to be. Um, and you can do it for a really good price, or something like this. They're going to like this, too, um, because of sweet, if they like sweet. Uh, but there is a real difference if you put uh, something that's been uh, sweetened with sugar uh, compared with the natural grape sugar. And um, you, if you can appreciate this in the ways that Steve Richards said, um, for what it is, it's, it's pretty good stuff. I think it's a great um, thing to try and get, we try with our mm -hmm. customers sometimes to try and get them at, to make it a part of their meal. Mm -hmm. A great way to finish a wonderful meal. Uh, it could even be the dessert course, just something mm -hmm. to sip on. And, uh, but it's a it is a neat product, and for a special occasion for me, I think it's a great way to share that with some friends. Of course, it doesn't have to be special. You can pick up a bottle whenever you need one. Um, Steve, did, I did not catch the retail price on that. I don't remember. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry about that, but it's on the website. So. Oh, no, okay, you can go on uh, Nap Vineyard's Nap website, up. and uh, that information is definitely there. All right, well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we'll probably have you and Steve uh, help us with a few other questions if we have time. But we're going to move on to uh, our last panelist in our dessert flight this evening. We have from Standing Stone Vineyards on the east side of Seneca Lake. We have uh, owner Martha Masinski. And uh, Marty has been making these style of wines for some time. Um, I, I would say, honestly, like, um, some of Standing Stone's wines made in this style were what helped me to tasting them, made me excited that we could make something like that. And I recently had a chance to taste a variety of Finger Lakes dessert wines, and every one of Standing Stone's, and I think there was, is there three or four? Four were like some of my favorites that were in a tasting of like 25 wines. So 
Marty uh, does a great job with the style of wines, and with that, I'm going to let Marty talk a little bit about something that I don't think is common in the Finger Lakes, the Diverse Dreamer Ice. 2010. And I'll start with a suggested retail price. Thank you. <laughs> of $24.99. Thank you. Um, which has a lot to do with how, why we do it the way we do. Uh, we started in 1995 making ice wine, real ice wine from Vidal grapes, and it worked out well, although uh, those were the days when you pretty much had to offer a bottle and tasting to sell a bottle. So we've come a long way from that. And then for the next four years, we tried to make an ice wine and watch the birds and the wind and the turkeys and the coyotes do away with the grapes. And in the meantime, we did some research about artificial freezing. And so again, in 1999, we started over. And that year, we tried it both ways. We did some real frozen grape-picked ice wine and some artificially frozen grape ice wine, ice-style wine. I'm careful to distinguish. Um, and we really believed that there wasn't a significant difference other than when you pick real ice wine grapes, at least on our farm with the wind load we have and the critter load we have, um, you lose about 80% of your yield. And so you've got to charge a fortune and a half for it. And we don't like doing that. Our prices are pretty reasonable. We'd rather have things that people can drink every day or every week. And so we moved to the artificial freezing method. Um, we try to wait until the leaves are off the vines and the grapes are starting to shrivel uh, because we think that changes the flavor profile. It gives There's a bit of a nuttiness to each of our wines that um, I think comes through from that. Uh, but really the determining factor is when the birds move in for the kill. And even with the netting, um, birds can get through netting. And so at some point when we're going to have incredible crop losses, we pick, we freeze them, and we wait. Um, I personally don't like fermenting sweet wines while I'm finishing up Cabernet. It just feels like a bit of a mess in the cellar. So we wait until winter, we bring the grapes back, and they are frozen, frozen, frozen. They come to us out of storage at five below zero. They're like little marbles. And when we put them in the press and it's nice and cold outside, um, nothing happens. For about the first 12 hours, they just sort of get squished. And after about 12 hours, we start to see a drip. And after 48 hours, we are down to about 35 bricks juice, and we cut it off and um, go on to the next press load. And uh, so the good news is our press gets better utilization than a lot of presses in the Finger Lakes, and we're working all winter, um, which theoretically we have nothing to do, so that solves that problem. Um, and we've just had a fun time playing with first of it all, and then we added Chardonnay one year just as a little bit of an experiment. And honestly, the Riesling and Gewürztraminer, we started simply because the 08 crop was so enormous that I had to tell them to stop picking grapes because we had no more tank space. So we picked and froze them and said, we'll see if they work. Um, they did. And so we now make uh, four different ice style wines, all made with the artificial freezing process. Uh, very, very different flavors, and you're right, we're, we're all seeing it, that a lot of people, especially those fine wine, very educated type of folks, come into the tasting room and say, no, I'm not going to try your ice wine. And we won't let them out the door. So our tasting, our basic tasting, always includes one ice style wine, and we offer to rinse with Cabernet if they really hate it. And you'd be amazed how many people, when they've actually tasted one and thought about it and heard the story and thought about it being affordable, actually walk out the door with one or sometimes two or sometimes all four because they're different colors and they look pretty together. Um, but the Gewürztraminer has been a big surprise. I was a little skeptical because to me the hallmark of what makes ice style dessert wines work is acid. That's why we've all mentioned, you've all said that it all is such a natural. And we all know that Gewürz has no acid at all if it's ripe. And now we're waiting beyond ripening. Um, but the freezing does the same thing on the Gewürz grapes as it does on the Vidal grapes, which is to concentrate both the sugar and the acidity. And so once again, we're getting the balance that we need to give all that sugar weight something to hang on to. And um, we just think they're, they're really fun in this way. You can have a dessert every night of the week and a different ice wine to go with it. So Marty, I know um, since you're using a similar style to we, uh, what we use at Lucas, um, could you talk a little bit about what kind of a yield you get from that process? 
because even though we're doing a process like that, the yield is still quite low Teeny, compared yes. with regular wine processing. Yes, I know one of the questions came in about how many grapes in a bottle, and we tend not we tend to think a little more macro than that. So the example I use is a normal ton of grapes. If we picked Gewürztraminer at normal harvest, like we did a couple of weeks ago, and pressed it, we would get 160 gallons per ton. When we pick these frozen grapes, and, and this is pretty universal whether it's picked frozen on the vine or picked and artificially frozen, we just tend to get more of the grapes for our use. Um, but we're only getting about 40 gallons of juice per ton of grapes. So it's a quarter of the yield. Um, which, again, I think once people understand what goes into it, whether we're picking frozen grapes or not, we're still getting such a small yield that it counts in some part for the price. Um, this could be answered by any of the panel, really. Is uh, ice wine the predominant style of dessert wine in the Finger Lakes? Just kind of a question that was asked for the whole panel. Anybody yeah, want to take that? Ice, ice or iced, yes. Yeah, I think that there are only a very few late, true late right, harvests. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and just a handful of pork style. Right. right. And um, Steve or Marty, um, I'd ask Steve Richards, uh, ideal food pairings for ice wine. Would either one of you like to throw out an ideal pairing you have? Well, it's nice by itself. I mean, Steve's recommendation was really sounded really good too but with ripe cheese or I think it goes nicely with that or uh, dried fruit also. I tend with the Gewurz I tend to think a little more spice so I've done ginger snaps, I've done white chocolate shortbread with dried cherries, I've done um, spice cake, carrot cake, that kind of flavor, cardamom and cinnamon desserts. Sounds and that's cool. kind of the fun part with the Gewurz. We're going over to Marty's <laughs> after the uh, tasting. <laughs> We're going right. to have a little uh, after uh, virtual tasting. I know tasting. one of our tour operators also, when she comes and brings people, she uses dried fruit, like dried mangoes, apricots, and she really likes the white chocolate combination as well, especially with the Gewurz. Um, with the Vidal, I think if, if you're going the dessert route, the darker the chocolate, the better. There's something about the acidity against that really rich, dark chocolate that works well. Great. Well, I want to um, take a moment and thank uh, our second group of panelists for uh, coming in this evening and uh, tasting wine and answering some questions. Um, I thought the wines tasted great, and you guys did a great job. And I'd like to thank our media who were with us this evening, and of course, uh, Stephanie Jarvis for putting together all these Finger Lakes wine virtual tasting series. And this is our last one of this year. We've had a great time doing them. And um, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you guys next year. Thank you. Whoa, awesome, guys. Awesome.